episode of Tim's Lawn and Garden. Okay, so we're we're here with the uh, the broccoli, and as you can see, the the plants are sort of about two inches or so high now. So we're, what I'm going to be doing is picking these out exactly like I do in the spring. All I do is just basically take a, a lollipop stick and just put it underneath the plant. Now, obviously, always remember that you you know you need to pick them up by the effectively by one of the leaves. Now I don't know if you can see that, but we've just got the the second or the sort of the true leaf coming. So uh, I'm just pricking these out. Obviously, with the you know when you're pricking out anything like this, the the stem of the plant, this this part here, will never recover if it's damaged. The roots will recover and the leaves will recover. So if you're ever taking them out, obviously always remember to either pick it up by the roots or the leaves. Um, I'm just bobbing that in there and basically just firming the soil around. Now I'm I'm putting these in the square pots, just like I did the first lot. Um, so uh, basically all I'm going to do is carry on doing this. Now this is obviously the second batch. Now I don't normally grow um, a second batch of um, broccoli or calabrese. But the reason I'm doing it is obviously I'm picking this one up by the, by the roots. Because there's a reasonable root ball coming out with that. Uh, the reason I've done this is the, uh, the first lot that I've put out, for some reason, um, I believe it's the weather, um, has, has sort of already um, sort of gone over and... Um, you know we're already harvesting it now. Typically, you harvest this this crop sort of towards the end of July, um, or at least in this this part of the country we do. And um, as I say, I'm already cropping it, so it's 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 kind of come a month or so, um, at least a month, if not more, early than it would do normally. So I've got two there, so I'm just separating them by the leaves. Um, and what I'll do is I'll I'm going to wait till the others have. Um, Sort of grown and uh, and sort of harvested as much as I can off them, and then as soon as I've uh, I've done that, what I'm going to be doing is taking all of those out, feeding them to the chickens, obviously, because uh, any any brassicas. If you've got chickens, uh, you know br um, chickens love brassicas. So what I'll be doing is feeding them to the chickens, and I'll be putting the second load in. Now I'm I'm hoping that um, I'm hoping that the um, the second batch will will um, harvest in time for the. Um, by the end of the season. I don't know, I've never grown it this late before, so this is a bit of an experiment. But we'll have to see how we go. But the first lot, I don't know if it's uh, typically when the, um, you know, sort of run to flower or whatever, it's typically either, um, typically either you've, you've, you've let them run dry or the pot bound or, you know, something along them lines. Now, they most certainly weren't pot bound and they've been watered almost every night, so I, I know they've not run dry. So the only thing I can think of is, is it's, it's just this combination of hot days, freezing cold nights, and that's kind of shocked the plants and uh, unfortunately they've, they've, uh, they've, they've grown them out of the air. However, we've got a second batch in now and these are going to grow really quickly this time of year, so all being well I'll be putting these out in about sort of three weeks or so, three or four weeks, and then I should have um, sort of the end of July, August and potentially into September before these will actually start to... Uh, uh, be able to harvest. So I'll just put the rest of these in now, and I'll um, I'll, I'll I'll show you when I've finished. Okay, so now I'm going to do the uh, the black hollyhocks, and there you go. There the there the plants. And I'll just show you one up. I'll just show you one up close. So there's one of the there's one of the plants there. So as you can see, they're quite well developed. They're about. Um, Almost certainly an inch and a half, two inches high, and you can see that they've got the first sort of set of true leaves. There's another one actually coming there on that one. Um, so in, in exactly the same way, I'm going to pop these up, 
and you can see the roots are sort of coming out of the bottom as well so they're most certainly ready. Now I'm putting these in the square pots again purely because I'm limited on room in the greenhouse at the moment so uh, what I want to do is try and pack them as close together as I can uh, just at least for the first few months anyway. So all I'm doing is just putting the uh, I'm just putting the um, let's move these out of the way. I'm just putting the lollipop stick underneath the plant again, um, just to just to lever it out. And obviously by grabbing the grabbing the leaves like that, I'm just sort of teasing it, teasing it out like that. So there's the there's the root ball. You know I'm just going to knock a bit of that soil out. So what I'm going to do now is basically bob that into a pot like that, and I'm just going to gently put some soil around the edge. Now this is really good quality compost, um, this is, uh, you know, because obviously what you need to consider is they're going to be in these pots for a few months now, so the, they're probably going to be in here for sort of two or three months, and then they're going to be potted up into larger pots later in the season when they're, they're a bit more established. So, um, you know, so the compost needs to be, you know, you know, sort of good quality compost. With things like the uh, the brassicas, you know, you can afford to go a little bit cheaper with the compost with them, because obviously they're only going to be in the pots for a month or so, and then they're going to be out, you know, on a matter of weeks. Um, you know, they're going to be out in the garden. But most certainly, when you come to plants that are going to be in a pot, you know, for a reasonable amount of time, you know, what you need to do is. Um, you know, make sure that there's enough food in there for them. Now, there's the next one. Now, I've actually got two here, so I'm just going to very, very gently tease them apart. Um, now, that one, I'm just going to bob straight into a pot here, and I'm not firming them down too much. You know, I'm, uh, I'm letting them <coughs> find the way. Now, with the, with the brassicas I've just put in. Um, there, you know, you want to get the soil reasonably firm in there. So there's the, that's a slightly smaller one. And all I'm, all I'm going to do now is just basically go around. Now this one, again, has got two in. I'm just sort of teasing it out, just to get it by the roots. So there you go, there's the, there's the, the, uh, the roots on the bottom. And as I say, there's two in here, so I'm just going to, by the leaves, I'm just going to gently tease that one out. No, I'm not going to waste that. That's that's. Uh, I'm going to pop that up. Um, with the compost you buy today, you find all sorts in it. I mean, this this is obviously made from at least partially made from uh, recycled material. You know what you put in your compost bin. I'm I'm finding bits of bits of. Um, well, that was a bit of plastic. I don't know where it's gone there. Yeah, look. Looks like a bit off a off a fence or something like that. I don't know. So you know, even the even the small ones like that, I'm uh, going to put them in because these will obviously develop into the uh, you know the hollyhocks. Now, with with hollyhocks, as I've explained before, you know they are um, sort of biannual, half hardy perennials. So what I'm going to be doing is sort of growing these on in the greenhouse till. Um, till next year really so they're going to stay in pots till at, at least the back end of this year just be really careful pulling them apart um, so they're going to stay in the going to stay in the pots till you know so at least the back end of this year and then what I'll be doing is either planting them out in the autumn or uh, what actually probably I will do to be honest with you is I'll overwinter these in the greenhouse um, now clearly I don't need as many as I'm growing here so you know, I'd say at least at least two thirds of these I'll be giving away to friends and that um, because they'll be uh, you know they'll enjoy them as well. I mean, really with hollyhocks because they're such a large plant, you only really need sort of I don't know half a dozen if that you know, and that'll fill a border quite well. So um, so I'll be keeping about half a dozen of these. So probably the ones I've already done are probably the ones that I've had. As you can see, there's another sort of 20, 30 plants here. So I'll be uh, giving those away. We do have charity events on the allotment, so <coughs> we have a cancer research um, week where we open up and people come and have a look and, and all the rest of it. So they'll probably sell some there. So what I'll be doing is, uh, um, you know, I'll, I'll donate some then, and then obviously there'll be, there'll be friends in that that no doubt will want some. So I'm just going to continue to pop these up, and then um, as soon as I've finished, I'll I'll do a quick tour today because. Unfortunately, the weather's not very good today. It's been raining quite badly, and 
I can't do anything outside. I was going to put the leaks out today, but that's not going to happen now. So, so I'll just continue doing this, and then I'll, I'll, um, I'm just going to do the verbena and the uh, and the candra as well, um, or at least as many of them as I possibly can do, and then I'll show you what they look like when they're finished. <laughs> Okay, so I just want to do some of the comments and questions that have come over um, in, the, in the last week or so. First one comes from, uh, well, there's actually three. There's, there's Mark Davis, there's um, Gardening with Puppies, and uh, Richard uh, Sydenham. Thank you all for your comments. And it's regarding the, um, the blight that we've had on the um, strawberries, or, uh, sorry, the tomatoes, or at least I believe that it's blight. Um, now, wh what I've done is I've walked down the field, which is just over the other side of the hedge over there, and that's a field full of potatoes, and I've noticed that that's all, 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 all of the potatoes in there are showing signs of blight as well, so I think it's possibly come from over there. But anyway, basically Mark said that um, it, it looks like either um, tomato spot or um, potato virus Y. Uh, Garning with puppies said that it, it obviously is some kind of fungal issue. Um, and uh, Richard has said that uh, it looks like early blight and in all three cases they've advised that the best thing to do is to get some baking soda a teaspoon to mi mix up some um, baking soda and water uh, one teaspoon to a gallon of water and then spray the, um, the tomatoes so I have already done that once and what I will do is do that again uh, perhaps a couple of times over the next um, sort of week so for all I've done is basically mixed up in here uh, some water and some baking soda and I'm just spraying the uh, the leaves but to be honest with you um, it's it's not spread or got any worse than it has last week so fingers crossed we should be okay but I think it's because of this damp weather it's actually raining at the moment I don't know if you can hear it but uh, I think it's because of the damp weather that we've had and also this hot cold hot cold I think that's what's done it and it's it's caused some um, sort of dew on the leaves and stuff like that and obviously if I've been watering I've potentially got the leaves wet and um, it's it's you know it's caused this fungal problem so thank you all three of you for your um, um, suggestions and, uh, and help with that I do appreciate that. Um, Mark also um, um, gave a little bit of advice he was talking about um, when I was doing the pleaching on the trees um, uh, last week um, and I was using uh, with the with the espalier trees I was using cable ties to hold them on and he was saying that uh, Wilco's are doing this velcro um, sort of tape if you like on one side's the the sort of the hooky bit and on the other side is the you know you know the sort of the soft um, sort of cottony bit and then you can sort of put that around and that's supposed to be quite good so I will have a look at Wilco in Wilco's next time I'm there um, I think we do actually use something very similar at work and we use it to put around cables just to temporarily hold cables together so I, I know what you're talking about so what I'll do is I'll have a look and I'll, I'll sort of use that the, the, the issue that I potentially will have outside is if it gets wet um, it, it may potentially hold the water against the, the, the tree so that inside I think with the tomatoes I think it'd probably be a good idea but uh, potentially outside um, I'm, I'm not quite sure I'll have to have a look at the stuff you know, but with it being like a nylon type of material you know water should you know should, should stay on it for long anyway but um, thank you for that um, the next one comes from um, Ravnos and she was saying how big is your greenhouse and how did you prepare the base there have been various videos in the past of me explaining this but just very quickly this greenhouse is um, it's 10 foot long and it's it's 8 foot wide um, I actually bought this from the Gardener's World Show at the NEC, there was a company there that were um, advertised it and I actually, seven years, six, six years, seven years, seven years ago, I paid um, £250 for this greenhouse and, and I thought that was a real bargain. There's, there's similar greenhouses to this in my local um, garden centre which are well over £1,000 and I paid about £250, so do shop around. If you are going to buy a greenhouse, I would strongly recommend you shop around, look on the internet because there are a lot of... Um, companies on the internet which do import and do make them in the UK as well and you will get a considerably cheaper greenhouse exactly the same quality in, pro in fact probably the same make but uh, if you go to a garden centre you will most certainly pay three or four or five times the amount that you will do on the internet so if you are going to buy a greenhouse go on the internet they do deliver them to the, uh, you know to your door so it's uh, it, it, it's well worth um, you know sort of doing that um, and actually the company that I bought this from will actually erect it for if you want them to as well, for, obviously for additional price. Um, and uh, the other th the question that Ravos got was, was how did I prepare the base? Now, when you point a greenhouse up, you need to have a good solid base because if the greenhouse twists and contorts 
as it as as the weight of the glass goes in what you will get is the glass cracking and breaking stuff like that so the foundations have got to be absolutely right and what I did is I this this ground here hadn't been um, you know sort of dug or anything like that so it was nice firm ground and all I did was leveled the ground and uh, got it nice and you know walked all over it and got it all nice and um, sort of compacted and, and solid um, and then what I did is I put on um, slabs now I slabbed the entire area and what I did is I over um, the, the actual base that it's on is bigger than the greenhouse itself so if you look around the edge of, um, the, of the greenhouse there's probably about three or four inches all the way around it of the, of the slabs that, that it's sitting on and so I slabbed the entire area and then um, I bolted the, um, the base which is like an aluminium sort of oblong if you like so obviously eight foot by ten foot and that's all sort of bolted drilled into the um, into the slabs with raw plugs and then screwed into that all the way around um, and the um, so I got all of that level and so it was all perfectly level and then and then I built the greenhouse on but uh, the, the one bit of advice that I can give you is make sure that the that the base is solid and level if you don't do that you will have problems erecting the actual greenhouse and potentially if the ground starts to subside in one corner or whatever then the, the, the frame of the greenhouse as it's only aluminium will bend and twist and potentially you'll break the glass in the greenhouse so it's well worth your while taking your time and getting the base right and then obviously you know the greenhouse you'll never have a problem with and obviously if you're going to invest in a greenhouse you're going to want it to be there for at least 10, 15, 20 years if not more so it, it's well worth your while getting the base right first and then obviously you, you know sort of erecting the greenhouse the other bit of advice, if you're going to put the greenhouse up yourself, is um, glaze it in one go. Um, don't um, don't sort of partly glaze it and then leave it, because if you get a, um, a, a storm or a, or a bit of wind or something like that, it will blow the glass out. A greenhouse is only um, stable when all of the glass is in it. If you start to take bits of glass out, uh, it, it does become unstable. So what I would suggest you do is, is, is get the base right, Put the put the um, put the frame together completely, and then before you start to put any glass in it whatsoever, make sure that you've got all of the glass that you need um, and some spares, hopefully, um, just in case. And uh, make sure that all the glass is ready to go in, and it's all it's all in one piece. You've got all the clips, you've got all the bits and bobs that you need, you've got all the rubber seals that go down, and all the rest of it. As soon as you're absolutely sure you've got that ready, then what I suggest is you put all the rubber seals round. In, you know the roof, the walls, everything. Um, get all that in. Then you know you've got all, all that ready. So all you got to do then is literally just put the glass in. Bang, bang, bang. Um, now, um, as soon as you've done that, what I would suggest you do is glaze each of the gable ends, which is the the the, the end with the door on it and the opposite end. Glaze those first because they're the they're quite structural because um, they're going to take the weight of the roof basically, and then. Glaze the sides, so the sides that go upright um, either side, and then as soon as you've done that, I would suggest you do the roof last. So that's the best bit of advice I can give you. Um, the next comment comes from uh, Daniel Jenkins, and uh, and he was saying that he's got less time this year than he can uh, that, that he's had in the past, and he's got an area that's that he, he wants to control the weeds. What's the best way of doing that? The best advice I can give you, you know, obviously you don't want to use sprays and stuff like that. The best bit of advice I can give you is to um, get yourself some old carpet or some or some black plastic and, and obviously get all the weeds down and then put the black plastic over, weight it down with bricks so it, you know it's all the way around, then get a fork and stab holes all, all over it and then just leave it like that and that'll keep the weeds down and control everything for you. Okay so just going back to um, Ravnos, um, also talking about um, slabs and stuff like that for the um, you know for your greenhouse in your shed. Don't go out buying them. Um, look look in the paper, the um, um, sort of free bay, um, eBay and stuff like that. And what you will find is people that have that have sort of changed the garden around and stuff like that have got a load of slabs um, that that you can nine times out of ten they're free to collect. So if you go along with your car, some you know somewhere reasonably local, you can pick up the slabs. Or if you've got a trailer, even better, and uh, you can bring the slabs. Now I didn't pay for the slabs that uh, um, this this, this greenhouse is on. In fact, all of the slabs that you see around the allotment. All the paths, what's the, the what the uh, the carrot beds are made out of? All the slabs that are sitting, uh, you know, sort of underneath this greenhouse and all round. I haven't paid a penny for any of them because I've picked them all up free of charge from people who have been changing driveways or or, uh, or anything like that. So do keep your eye open. 
Local councils also um, sort of recycle slabs and stuff like that, so don't go out and buy them because you can spend a fortune. I mean, potentially, you, know, you could be spending sort of three, four pound on, on on a slab where you can pick them up for nothing. And obviously, if you're going to put a greenhouse on it, you know they haven't got to be um, you know sort of brand new or anything like that. You know you can recycle, which is always best for the environment anyway. So what I would suggest is under your shed and under your greenhouse. Find yourself some recycled slabs and use them and put a really good solid base down and, uh, and don't spend much money because you don't really need to. Um, the next um, one comes from Chris, um, Chris Holm I think that you, you pronounce your surname, I apologise if that's wrong. And he's, um, he's very kindly put a comment on my um, channel regarding um, Roundup the, uh, the weed killer. Now Roundup the weed killer has got a substance in there called glyphosate. And and this is um, this is a substance which is which is obviously an active substance which which is used to kill the weeds, but it's also quite harmful. Um, the International Agency of Research, the IR um, IARC, um, the uh, the chairman Aaron Blair has put out a report to say that um, of, uh, of the American National um, Cancer Institute uh, to say that there's sufficient evidence that that this, that this substance. Um, is, is harmful to animals and um, there's limited evidence for humans however um, there is there is scientific evidence that this um, glyphosate um, which I think is the way you pronounce it um, causes damage to uh, chromosomes and will also cause DNA mutations which is effectively cancer so um, please be really careful when using Roundup or any other weed killer which contains this. Um, obviously I am no expert on this matter but what I'll do is I'll put across the bottom of the screen now a link to the report so you can all read that and make your own minds up. But um, just please be careful. If you are going to use Roundup then um, obviously wear a mask and you know sort of cover your arms and everything like that. Um, but it, in all honesty I would suggest that you don't use it. Okay, so the next comment comes from um, Scott O'Neill, and um, and he was saying that he watched the uh, the episode where I was making the um, the incinerator, and um, and he was saying that he thought the um, the trick by putting a magnet in a plastic bag to um, to pick up the um, uh, the iron filings and the bits of metal and stuff like that was was really useful. So I just wanted to quickly explain if anybody's not seen that episode. Um, basically, what I do is if I'm ever cutting up metal and stuff like that, obviously you're going to get sort of filings and swarf and bits of metal going all over the place. And if you've got a garden, obviously I've got chickens and dogs and cats and stuff like that, and obviously kids. Um, I don't want to leave sort of bits of metal all over the place. And apart from the fact it will damage the soil as well. So what I always do is get yourself a strong magnet. You can pick them up from you know, sort of all over the place. If you haven't got a strong magnet, you know, even just a magnet that you put on a fridge will, you know, will do the job. Perhaps not quite as well, but you know, get, get yourself a nice strong magnet, put that inside a plastic bag, you know, a carry bag or a food bag or something like that, and then just rub that all the way around where you've been cutting. And what it'll do is it'll attract all of the iron filings and the bits of metal and the sharp shards and all that stuff to it, and then just turn the bag inside out so you pull the magnet off it, and then you end up with all of the, the nasty bits of metal and stuff inside the bag. Tie that up, put it in the bin, and then you haven't got to worry about it. So, you, you know, that was just a tip I'd just like to share with everybody. Next one comes from two people, um, Foodie Laura and also Sandy Moth. Thank you for your comments. Um, and they were saying about the uh, the hydroponic plant. Just want to explain what I'm thinking of doing. You've seen the weather vanes in the, um, in, uh, the allotment. What I'm going to do is make another one which is similar to um, the large one, which is on the right-hand side, from, as I'm looking at it from now. The one that's got the checkered black and white. And what I'm going to do is, rather than it just spinning ground, um, what I'm going to do is have a um, like a, a shaft coming off it, going down. And obviously, as the as the weather vane turns around, it's going to also also turn the um, turn the shaft. That shaft's going to go all the way to the ground, so that the weather vane's going to be I don't know eight, nine, ten foot in the air, so it catches the wind, so it spins around. And then this shaft is then going to go down, pretty much all the way down to the ground. And on the end of that shaft, what I'm going to do is put um, Either a, a pond pump or a um, um, or a screen jet pump off a car or, or something like that. Some you know some kind of water pump. And what that's going to do is, as the weather vane turns around, that's going to turn the pump. Obviously, I'm going, I'm going to take the electric motor off it and then just put the shaft straight onto it. So basically, what that will do is that will turn the pump, which will then pump water up, probably about two foot or so, to the top of the um, hydroponic pipes, which are going to run down either side of the uh, the raspberry canes and then I'm going to be planting planting that probably strawberries to be honest with you so the water is going to be flowing up down the pipes and then back around and then into the 
into the reservoir and then it'll be pumped back up and then away you go. So as the as the wind turns the weather vane, this is basically going to pump the water round like a system which is going to generate the hydroponics. Now I will be doing this um, either later this year or next year, I'm not going to do it this year, um, but um, I'm Obviously, these 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 sort of pumps you can't sort of buy. So basically, what I'm going to do is get a like a pond pump or something like that. I'm not quite sure yet. I'm going to have a look around some sort of I don't know some car boot sales and stuff like that. To see if I can find a water pump. And uh, basically, take the motor off it and then just connect the the shaft off the of the weather vane to that. And that's going to basically generate the the, the pressure to pump the water up and around the system. So that will be covered up in the next few episodes. So I'm sorry I didn't explain that particularly well last time. But you can't actually buy these units. You know, I, I'm actually going to sort of make something out of a, a pump, and um, you know, I'm obviously going to make all the rest of the weather vane. So that'll be coming up soon. Next one comes from uh, um, Ken Fuller um, and also Nigel Muddy Boots over in Wolverhampton. Thank you both. Um, Ken said that he grows squashes amongst his corns. Because they're like a, you know, they'll grow well together, and also uh, Nigel said something along the similar lines that because uh, I planted the gourds amongst the uh, the runner beans, uh, he said that he's, you know, that it, he thinks it'll be okay. Cause he's done something similar in the past, so fingers crossed they'll grow okay. So um, that was all of the comments for this week. The one thing I would like to say very quickly is I apologise to Tina Reeve. Um, I have posted your beans down to you. I'm sorry I didn't see your comment till. Um, I'm not quite sure why, because I checked it last week and it wasn't there. Then it's it was there two days ago, but it said it had been there for two weeks. So I'm not quite sure, a bit of a glitch in YouTube. But uh, anyway, they're on the way to you now. Okay, so now I'm going to put in the Nicandra. As you can see, germination rate is extremely good. So I don't know how many plants I've got. It's ridiculous, to be honest with you. I think I've quite possibly got 300 plants here. What I'm going to do is rather than take these out because there's so many in there, I'm going to use one of use one of these. This has got this has got far less uh, plants in here, but um, so this one's actually got one, in, so that's quite good. So right, so there's the there's the actual plant, and this is the um, Nicander is the uh, the purple. I showed you a picture of it I think a couple of weeks ago um, on the video, but. Uh, that's, uh, that's that's gone in there quite nicely, and I am very quickly running out of room in the greenhouse. It's uh, it's amazing how many actual plants I've got here. As you can see, when you've got too many of them, you know you literally end up with just a few roots. I don't know how, how, how well they're going to grow, and I've separated them. But uh, we'll see how we go with those. And basically, what I'm going to do is basically just pop these up in, in exactly the same way as uh, the others. Um, again, these plants are a uh, half hardy, um, half hardy annual, uh, but they will, you know, as long as, as long as the, um, you know, we don't have sort of too, too bad a frost, these will actually survive, um, you know, a winter. So uh, I know people who have had these for sort of three or four years, and they've just kept on going. So uh, there's not a lot of root to them, to be fair. I don't know, I'm going to separate the others, I've got sort of about 20 in each little module. I don't know if you can hear that, we're about to have a thunderstorm. It's, we've got thunder and lightning at the moment. So it's not raining yet, but I think it's going to be in a couple of minutes time. So that's the that's the Nicandra. And I'm just going to pot up as many of them as I can. And then I'll, um, I'll show you again what they look like when they're finished. <laughs> So thank you for watching this episode of Jim's Lot with Garden. I do hope it's been of some use to you. Please don't hesitate to put any comments or questions you've got below. And I'll see you on the next episode of Jim's Lot with Garden.